The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. Edited and abridged 2023 Cranky Octopus Productions. The 16th and 17th of July. The intense interest aroused in the public by what was known at the time as the Styles case has now somewhat subsided. Nevertheless, in view of the worldwide notoriety which attended it, I have been asked, both by my friend Poirot and the Cavendish family themselves, to write an account of the whole story. This, we trust, will effectually silence the sensational rumors which still persist. I will therefore briefly fit down the circumstances which led to my being connected with the affair. I begin with my first tea on that warm July afternoon where the whole of Styles Court was gathered together on the great back lawn. Givy joined the gathered from around the corner of the house, and pulling off gardening gloves, she announced her presence in her characteristic stentorian tones. Reeds grow like house fire. Can't keep even with them. She'll press you in. Better be careful. See teas outside today. Good. Too fine a day to be cooped up in the house. Evie forcibly relocated the only vacant chair next to Alfred Inglethorpe as far away from the latter as she could. I felt the tension rise and hastened to change the loot, returning to the wide-eyed Cynthia sitting on the lawn beside me. You work in the Red Cross Hospital, is that right, Miss Murdoch? Yes, I do. I work in the dispensary. And how many people do you poison? <laughs> Hundreds. No. But really, if you people only knew how fatally easy it is to poison someone, you wouldn't joke about it. Florence, you came and visited us the other day. Tell everybody how many bottles there were. Can you imagine how easy it would be to make a mistake? Oh, awful Lawrence. Brooding about the poison covered, no doubt. Did you find what you were looking for? <laughs> <laughs> Zimdi gave a merry peal of laughter, and Lawrence scowled at both of them in turn over his teacup. In the ensuing pause, Mr. Inglethorpe turned to me and addressed me in his painstaking voice. Is soldiering your regular profession, Mr. Hastings? I never had a study job as of yet. I have a friend who was a rather famous Belgian detective, and that has always interested me. Actually, I believe he's staying here. Do you know Hercule Poirot? Oh, we know Monsieur Poirot. Like a good detective story myself. Lots of nonsense, though. Criminal discovered in last chapter. Everybody dumbfounded. Real crime you'd know at once. Although they say there have been a great number of undiscovered crimes. Don't mean the police, but the people who are right in it. The family. You couldn't really hoodwink them. They'd know. So, Miss Howard, if you were mixed up in a crime, say, a murder, you'd be able to spot the murderer right off? Of course I should. Mightn't be able to prove it to a pack of lawyers, but I'm certain I'd know. I'd feel it in my fingertips if he came near me. Might be a she. Might. But murder's a violent crime associated more with a man. Not in the case of poisoning. Why, Dr. Bowerstein was saying just yesterday that owing to the general ignorance of the more uncommon poisons amongst the medical profession, there are probably countless cases of poisonings quite unsuspected. Why, Mary, what a gruesome conversation. It makes me feel as if a goose were walking over my grave. Cynthia, could you write some letters for me? Certainly, Aunt Emily. Alfred, darling, will you come along as well? Cynthia sprang up from the lawn obediently, and Alfred, with every demonstration of the tenderest care, assisted Emily out of her own basket chair. Before departing, Mrs. Inglethorpe turned and addressed me directly. John will show you to your room. Supper is at half past. We've given up late dinner for some time now. Lady Tadminster, our member's wife, she was the late Lord Attenborough's daughter, does the same. She agrees with me that one must set an example of economy. We are quite a war household. 
Nothing wasted here. Every scrap of waste paper is reused or saved and sent away in sacks. I gave an appreciative nod of acknowledgement, and as the three departed, Miss Howard gave the most magnificent snort <laughs> and strode off across the lawn with determination. Miss Cavendish gave a weary sigh and set down her teacup. <sighs> I better go change. It's quite hot today, and the green of these land smocks might as well be black the way they absorb this midday sun. Mr. Hastings, it was a pleasure. As Jern led me into the hall, we heard the tail end of raucous shouting and saw Miss Howard storming down the stairs towards us. Her lips were grimly set together and she carried a small suitcase. I'm off! This minute! Afraid I said some things to Emily she won't soon forgive or forget. Don't mind if they've only sunk in a bit. Probably water off a duck's back, though. I said right out, you're an old woman, Emily, and there's no fool like an old fool. The man's twenty years younger than you, and don't fool yourself as to what he's married you for. Money! Don't let him have too much of it. Farmer Rakes has a very pretty young wife. Just ask your Alfred how much time he spends over there. She was very angry. Natural. I went on. I said, I'm going to warn you, whether you like it or not. That man would soon as murder you in your bed as look at you. He's a bad lot. You can say what you like to me, but remember what I've told you. He's a bad lot. What did she say? <gasps> Darling Alfred, dearest Alfred, Wicked calumnies, wicked lies, wicked woman, to accuse her dear husband. The sooner I left her house, the better. So I'm off. Miss Howard strode out of the hall towards the approaching car in front drive. John and Mary looked at each other in disbelief, and in the momentary pause, Miss Howard beckoned me to follow her outside. Once outside and alone, Mrs. Howard's physiognomy changed completely. She went eagerly towards me and sank her voice into a whisper. Mr. Hastings, you're honest. I can trust you. Look after her, Mr. Hastings. My poor Emily. They're all a lot of sharks. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. There isn't one of them that isn't hard up and trying to get money out of her. I protected her as much as I could, but now I'm out of the way they'll impose upon her. Before ducking into the car, she turned on me squarely and said with force, Above all, Mr. Hastings, watch that devil, her husband. As I watched the car drive away, for a moment, I had a premonition of approaching evil. The night of the tragedy. The next evening at dinner, the heat had not relented, and there was a strange atmosphere that had settled on the whole household after Miss Howard's party the previous afternoon. Mrs. Inglethorpe was looking almost bloodless at dinner, where she picked at her food in a distracted manner and could not follow the thread of conversation, let alone play the gracious hostess role she was accustomed to. In the lull between dinner and coffee service, I moved from my seat at the table and was unable to help overhearing the following scrap of conversation in passing. Mary Cavendish was saying in the voice of a woman desperately trying to control herself, Then you won't show it to me? My dear Mary, it has nothing to do with that matter. Then show it to me. I tell you, it is not what you imagine. It does not concern you in the least. Of course, I might have known you would shield him. Now, Mary, I'm going to lock this up in the case, and it is the last I want you to think about it. Cynthia was waiting for me in the drawing room and greeted me eagerly in a hushed whisper. I say, there's been the most awful row. I got it all out of Dorcas, the housemaid. You mean just now, or wait, who do you mean? And Emily and him. At least it must have been him, but she couldn't make out what he was saying in reply. Really? When? First thing this morning. It was a real old bust up. Mary had it too. What did she hear? 
Mrs. Inglethorpe said, You have lied to me and deceived me. How dare you? I have kept you and clothed you and fed you. You owe me everything. And this is how you repay me? By bringing disgrace upon our name? Nothing you can say will make any difference. I see my duty clearly. My mind is made up. You need not think any fear of publicity or scandal between husband and wife will deter me. This morning? But you seem perfectly cheery at tea time this afternoon. Cynthia! Send my coffee in here. I've just five minutes to catch the post. And bring me some stamps. There's none left in my bedroom desk. Do not trouble, Cynthia. I will take Emily her coffee. I will get the door, Dawkus. Dr. Ballastine, you were in a plight. Please, come in and join us for some coffee. Dr. Bowerstein was plastered with mud from head to toe, but Alfred Inglethorpe ushered him into the sitting room and poured him a fresh cup of coffee. What have you been doing, Doctor? Dr. Bowerstein laughed rather ruefully as he described how he had discovered a very rare species of fern in an inaccessible place, and in his efforts to obtain it, had lost his footing and flipped into a neighboring carn. My evening was utterly and entirely spoilt by the presence of Dr. Bowerstein and Mary's keen attentions to him. It seemed to me that a man would never go, but at last he rose, and Mr. Inglethorpe did the same. I will walk down to the village with the doctor. I must see our agent over those estate accounts. No one needs it up. I will take the latch key. It seemed to be the middle of the night when I was awakened by Lawrence Cavendish. He held a candelabra in his hand, and the agitation on his face told me at once that something was seriously wrong. Hastings, 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 wake up. Lawrence, what is it? What's wrong? It's her mother. We think she's having some sort of fit or something. I sprang out of bed, pulled on a dressing gown, and followed Lawrence down the passage and through the gallery to the right wing of the house. John Cavendish and one or two of the servants were standing around in a state of awestruck incitement. John rattled the handle of Mrs. Inglethorpe's door violently, but with no effect. Good. Hastings, you're here. I think we're going to need to break in the door. Wait. There's a connecting door through Cynthia's rooms. John turned to a maid and told her to wake Bailey and have him starve for Dr. Wilkins at once. He then ran rapidly down the corridor and returned a moment later. No good. Mary Chet. All the men. On the count of three. Please. The most alarming sounds were audible from the interior of the room. We strained and heaved against the solid framework of the door. Suddenly I realized that Alfred Inglethorpe was not with us. Finally, with a resounding crash, the door burst open. Mrs. Inglethorpe was running on the bed, her whole form agitated by violent convulsions, in one of which she lost an overturned bedside table. As we entered, however, her limbs relaxed and she fell back upon the pillows. I turned to Lawrence, and never have I seen a more ghastly look on any man's face. He was white as chalk. His eyes, petrified with terror, stared fixedly at the opposite wall at some point near the fireplace mantel. Suddenly, Mary Cavendish appeared in the doorway, entirely supporting Cynthia, who looked utterly dazed and unlike herself. The violence of Mrs. Inglethorpe's attacks seemed to be passing, and she was able to speak in short, sharp gasps. Better now, very sudden, stupid of me, to look myself in. However, a fresh access of pain seized the unfortunate old lady. The convulsions were of a violence terrible to behold. Everything was confusion. A final convulsion lifted her from the bed until she appeared to rest on her head and her heels with her body arched in an extraordinary manner. We thronged round her, powerless to help or alleviate. The moments flew. Again, the body arched itself in that particular fashion. At that moment, Dr. Bowerstein pushed his way authoritatively into the room. For one instant, he stopped dead, staring at the figure on the bed. And in the same instant, Mrs. Inglethorpe cried out in a strangled voice, her eyes fixed upon the doctor. Then 
she fell back, motionless against the pillows. With the arrival of Dr. Wilkins, Mrs. Inglethorpe's phone doctor, we were ushered out into the hall. Mary Cavendish turned to me with wide eyes. What is it, Hastings? Why did... Why did Dr. Bowerstein seem so peculiar? Want to know what I think? I think she was poisoned, and I'm certain Dr. Bowerstein suspects it. Mary fell back a pace, staring at me in horror, but I turned to John. John, remember me speaking of my friend, Monsieur Poirot? If there has been foul play, time is of the essence. Put, rubbish. Poisons are Dr. Ballastine's specialty, so of course he sees them everywhere. <sighs> I can't feel as you do, Lawrence. I'm inclined to get Hastings a free hand. I must urge you to proceed with the utmost discretion. No, you need not worry of that. Corot is discretion itself. And then I said the thing on everyone's mind. Where was Alfred Inglethorpe? With John's blessing, I started from Belgian house in the village. Five minutes delay, I allowed myself, however, spent in ransacking the library for information on strychnine poisoning. <laughs>